Hi, this is a chance for us just to quickly look at how um, to write up, I, I think, you know, what is uh, maybe not a perfect, but a good example of a electrostatic Gedanken lab that would get full marks. Um, I know there's various parts that, you know, it's easy to struggle on as you're going through a lab report. So just wanted to give you a chance to see some stuff here. So first of all, um, at the top of the lab, we do have to have name, block, and date. And so Elvis is doing this lab for us. He's doing it from far off in the future because uh, the king is alive. That's that's just a fact. Uh, then I've got the title of my lab here. And because it's a Gedanken, I did include that uh, the group that I'm from, which of course Elvis would be from Group Groovy, not just Group Alpha or anything like that. But it's just kind of a nice touch just because uh, it identifies what grouping of data you're going to be relying on and what I should be looking at for um, basically what am I going to mark you on. So for the objective, simple statement to determine the magnitude of charge on the pith ball. Nothing about the sign on the charge, nothing about how you're going to do the lab. Simply, we're measuring the magnitude of the charge. That's it. Second thing, hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis in a physics lab has to have three parts. So up here, I give my first part of my hypothesis, my educated best guess. It is impossible at this point in this kind of lab to say any actual number. You can't just say, I'm going to get 3.2 times 10 to negative 6 coulombs, because where are you pulling that number from? There's, there's no way that you could say something that specific. Also, you have to make sure that you're not saying something like, um, I'm going to do this based on, uh, you know, this, the sign. I, I'm going to get a positive charge. I'm going to get a negative charge. That, again, is not actually part of the objective. We're looking for the amount of charge. So the sign is irrelevant. It's actually not part of it when we're talking about magnitude. So we can't say stuff like that. Instead, what I've done here is I've given the best possible educated guess I can. I said, you know what? It's going to be a small charge. It's going to be in the micro coulombs range. That's it. Not a specific number, not talking about sign, and yet I'm still trying to answer something about the objective. Okay. I'm still saying something about a value, even if it has to be a roundabout value. If this was a lab where I was measuring gravity, then yes, I would say acceleration due to gravity has an accepted value of 9.81, done. But that's not the case in this lab. Next part is I have to say what the formula is. And please, you have to show the formula. You don't type out a word explanation of it. Formulas are formulas for a reason. English language is not well suited to show formulas. So show the actual formula. Now, what I did here is I did use um, up in uh, insert, uh, I chose equation and I, I used the tools that are there. Um, go ahead and try to figure that out if you want, because at least for small things like this, it shouldn't be that big a deal um, for you to be able to use it. And there's lots of YouTube videos that show it. Otherwise, what you could do is reasonably type it out as a formula. Uh, and as long as it's something reasonable, I can still recognize, then I can give you, you know, a pass on that or physically print it out on paper and then take a picture of it with your phone and insert the picture. Okay. Next though, still part of the second step, I identify what each variable represents along with units. So Fe is the electrostatic force measured in Newtons and on and on and on and on. You have to do this. And down here, I'm not identifying it as R squared because the fact that it's being squared in the formula is just a mathematical operation that's happening to it. Just like some of these things are being divided and multiplied and whatever. It's R. That's the measurement, which is the separation distance between the charges. Third step is where I identify my manipulated responding and controlled variables. What are we changing in this lab? We're changing the separation distance. We, as we progress through different trials, we are trying to measure at different distances. So that's what we manipulated. What's responding? The electrostatic force. Because each time I moved it to a different position, I measured how much force there was. Controlled variables? 
the two charges because they have to be kept the same throughout the lab or else our results are just going to go junky. Um, I don't really have to measure or mention Coulomb's constant here as a control because there's no way it can change. It is a physical constant of the universe. But what I really do when I'm looking down here at manipulated, responding, and controlled variables is I do look at the variables in my formula. And what did I change? What did I measure changed because of my changes? And what are the things that I had to keep the same? Honestly, that's all we have to do. Next, equipment. I listed the metal sphere in the pith ball. I mentioned the spring scale, and I said, oh, I'm going to use a meter stick to measure the uh, the distances. Whatever you said you want to use is totally fine. Uh, never mentioning paper, pencils, calculators. That's not part of the equipment of the lab. That's just you recording stuff and analyzing things, okay? It's the stuff, the equipment that I'd have to collect in a tote bin to say, here, use this to do the lab. That's what has to be in the list. And it does not require you to show uh, definitions of them. I did that in the lab manual just to help you out because I didn't think you knew what a pith ball was. Okay. Now, the procedure I've typed out here, I kept a little bit on the vague side and uh, left it maybe not the best procedure I've ever typed out, but it's because there are lots of different things that you could say in this section, and I'd still give you a pass on it, like it's fine. But basically what I said is mount the charged metal sphere so it cannot move. Um, some of you talked specifically about and give it a charge of, you know, whatever the charge was on it. Uh, that's fine also. But, you know, in some way saying, here, here's this metal sphere that we've got. Then a lot of you were saying things like, use insulating gloves to secure the pith ball to the spring scale. I'd, I'd love to know what you actually mean by insulating gloves. Uh, sure, they could be made out of plastic. They're still going to pick up charges from the pith ball. So the pith ball would have to get charged after the fact anyways. So if that's something that you wanted to say, say it. That's, that's fine. Step three, hold the pith ball at a separation distance of 0 0.050 meters. I'm telling you the distance. I don't just say hold it at a distance. That's not good enough. We have to be specific and say this is what you're going to do. Then in step four, measure the electrostatic force shown on the spring scale. And then step five, I'm saying do three and four again, increasing the separation distance by 0 0.05 meters each time until you have a total of six trials. That way I know what each of the following measurements is going to be also. Also remember always that a procedure must be a numbered list. There's no way of getting around that. Don't delete section five pre-lab questions. Just say none assigned because for this lab, there's none assigned. Probably the easiest part of the lab, observations. You've just got to stick in the observations table that I gave you for this one. Or if this was, you know, any other lab, you just put down your observations here. But here's a really critical thing. Notice I'm not showing what inverse squared values of R are. I can't. That's a calculation. That's analysis. That's me saying I need to do this for a reason. That simply cannot be shown in observations. Observations is raw data and nothing else. But the only thing that you'd be allowed to show here ever would be like a conversion where, you know, you could show uh, centimeters into meters. But even that, just show it in meters to begin with. Like, just do it. Um, really, there's absolutely nothing here that can be calculated values. That's analysis. Now, this was one of the weaker parts that I saw in this lab, simply because you don't seem as a group to want to talk about what you're doing. You just throw down some formulas and some numbers and you say, done. And I know you, you could do a lot of this on your Inspire. And yeah, that's, that's where I can go and look to see if you did it right. But you should be talking about your analysis. You should be saying, this is what I'm going to do and why. This is what I did and this is what I got. So you look at this, I say, hey, we're going to determine the charge on the pith ball by graphically looking at the slope of a force as a function of inverse squared separation distance graph since, and then I define what the slope is from that graph, it'll be Fe over R to the negative two. And then I also point out that from that formula that we had way up above, that if I had manipulated it to get that, it would be equal to KQ1Q2. Therefore, 
if I manipulate a little bit further with slope on the left side and KQQ on the right side, if I just use those parts, I can solve for Q1 equals the slope divided by KQ2. Then I say, hey, I did that graph on my Inspire. That's why I don't have to show it here. You know, go, go look on the Inspire file that was handed in. That's what I can do now because I know, yep, that's where I have to look for your work. And then I say the results of this analysis is the slope and the y-intercept values that I got. Now, let me show you how I stuck that stuff in to get a value. Now, granted, you could say, uh, you know, see those calculations on the Inspire file. That's okay. I just wanted to show it here because I wanted you to see what it looked like so you could kind of double check what you were doing. And then I make my final statement of that's what it means. The charge on the pith ball is. Notice also two sig digs because even though you have um, uh, some numbers that, you know, when you were dragging things into here, uh, might have looked like you had more sig digs maybe coming at you, check out all of these numbers. These are, these are your source values that you graphed. All of them are two sig dig values. So that's going to limit me to two sig digs here. And oh, wow, this is why we study sig digs, is so that when we observe values and then we analyze them, we get re reliable answers in the end that reflect that, uh, that set of observations. Now, for the error, whoops, um, you should talk about a bunch of errors. You should talk about how they affected your results, like what would that have done to your results? So I say, hey, humidity in the air could be a result, uh, could result in reduced charge on either one or both of the charged objects since polar water molecules can cancel charges. I'm saying this is what would happen. And then I talk about uh, how this would affect my results. This would be especially problematic if it happened steadily as the lab progressed. I mean that like as we are doing our measurements, more and more charges are being drained off, uh, and that this would result in a decreased amount of electrostatic force in the later trials. Then I say, what about reduced charged uh, charge that could happen to one or both of the objects uh, due to charging by conduction with other lab equipment used? That's basically things are touching other things. Some of the charge could be bled off to other objects then. That means that I wouldn't be dealing with the charges I thought I had. And I do say, um, you know, again, this would result in a lower than expected force between the objects. I also point out that we'd have a hard time measuring the separation between the objects, mostly because this involves a center to center measurement. Maybe I know the, uh, the radius of the spheres. And some of you actually mentioned measuring that by like measuring the circumference of the sphere and then getting a radius from that and then measuring surfaces to surfaces. That's a good idea. That's something that would minimize this sort of error, but it would still probably be there. I also do say that it'd be difficult to say, does that put us under or over the measured distances? It'd be difficult to predict how that actually would affect it in this lab. Then I also mentioned that our spring scale has to be unusually sensitive to these really small forces that we were measuring, and that if the scale was either old or not calibrated properly, it would affect the accuracy, choosing that specific word, accuracy, accuracy of our measurements. I don't know if they agree with what the values should be. And then I point out that since there's no accepted value for the charge on the pith ball, it's impossible for me to do a calculation error. Now, conclusion, I've got to answer my question and I've got to say something about how it reflected uh, to my hypothesis. I need to talk about things I could do better, different next time, things related to this. By performing our experiment and analyzing the results of uh, on a graph of force as a function of inverse square separation distance, we're able to find the charge of the pith ball to be 4.5 times 10 to negative 7 coulombs. Conclusively, this is my answer. Okay, don't say 14 other things, then give me the number, just come out and say, first sentence, this is the answer we got. Now, I can't say anything about an error. Normally, that would be expected here also. Instead, I do just kind of jump into talking about how does this compare to my uh, hypothesis. All this, although this value is not exactly in the microcoulomb range that we predicted, it is only one order of magnitude smaller. So, hey, I wasn't that bad compared to my hypothesis, really, when you consider the, the magnitude of the charges we're dealing with. I then said, 
uh, kind of in answer to one of my errors from up above. Maybe I could do this lab next time running a dehumidifier in the room to get rid of some of the moisture to try to minimize changes in the charge due to polar water molecules in the air. Then I point out a lab that is similar, not just because I'm doing a graph. That doesn't mean the lab is similar. A lab that is similar to doing things with charges, Coulomb's law, something like that. And I said, we could do the lab again using two charged objects that we know the charges on and then use that to experimentally val uh, measure the value for K Coulomb's constant. Now, the post lab question, I put down three answers here. Uh, you don't have to put down three answers, but these are answers that I got that are all basically reasonable and could get you the marks. The first and most common one is it's not necessarily necessary to take into account gravitational force simply because the gravitational force is so small compared to anything that the electrostatic force is going to do. Second thing you could say is that we can ex ignore the uh, gravitational force because I zeroed out the scale before I started the experiment. Or, and this again has something to do with maybe reflecting what you were saying in your, um, your procedure. Uh, if you were talking about somehow holding the pith ball to the side, then you would be potentially measuring only a horizontal uh, component of force, which would be entirely the electrostatic force. And you could ignore the vertical component of the force of gravity that you simply didn't measure. So remember, throughout this, what I'm trying to say is these are examples of what could be done in the lab. Your lab didn't have to be written out exactly like this to get a perfect mark, but these are the sorts of elements you have to watch out for when you're doing a great lab report. Thank you.